2018's a meh year by all accounts. The past 12 months have seen more than enough triumphs to prevent the world from descending into total madness. The midterm elections, Catriona Gray being crowned the year's Miss Universe, hashtag Pinoy Pride, the Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang, South Korea, France winning the FIFA World Cup, all that smooth jazz. But this was also a year of much turmoil that seemed to bring the world closer to bedlam. Losing wonderful people like the Three Steves, Stefan Carl Stephenson, Stephen Hawking, and Stephen Hillenburg, Aretha Franklin, Stan Lee, and George H. W. Bush, all influential people, all crushing losses felt the world over. And need I even talk about the influx of mass shootings this year? They speak for themselves. Oh, and something about YouTube Rewind being a massive dumpster fire? Yeah. It's rewind time. By comparison, animation in 2018 was quite good. Not really the highs of the middle of this decade, but it's been a dandy old time in the industry. From fresh beginnings to continuing legacies to satisfying conclusions, animation this year was fun, and I can't complain. I can only narrow down the cream of the crop, the best of the best, the tour de force, the annual pantheon. Ladies and gentlemen, I, the one and only C.R. Martin, present to you the top 10 best of animation in 2018. Churning butter and put on your church shoes, little sister, because we're about to blast off! Ralph, what is it you're trying to say? We're going on the internet. What? When it was officially announced, Ralph Breaks the Internet wasn't that exciting, especially not off of the heels of an infamous movie the year before with a similar concept. I hope you've learned your lesson, Sony. The concept itself is nothing groundbreaking. Oh boy, a hero traversing an idealized image of the internet, packed to the brim with all the things we know the internet for. There's social media, there's the internet lexicon, there's stuff like pop-ups and malware, the whole enchilada. Oh, and it's Disney on top of that. You know what that means? Princesses, Marvel, Star Wars, ESP freaking N. In addition to not being too imaginative, it ran the risk of coming off as blatant pandering and Disney touching themselves. As if I needed another excuse to hate them. It's still a sore spot for me, okay? But my take on reviewing is that the execution is the foundation of anything. As brilliant as an idea might be, if it's squandered, the end product is bad. On the flip side, a blasé concept can work if the craftsmanship works. By that token, Ralph Breaks the Internet pulls off the Journey Through Cyberspace story respectably well. Yes, it makes up for its distant, distant cousin. Every last idea here is employed to maximum effect. Some were used more predictably than others, but it stops the film from being overtly gimmicky. Plus it looks pretty, if not a bit cookie cutter. I can't put it any higher for plot and character related issues, which crop up around the second act. Vanellope, you are an ungrateful bitch! Outside of that, Ralph Breaks the Internet is a worthy sequel to a modern classic. Though it favored modernity more than timelessness, I had a good time, all things considered. The Creek is a place where we can all be whatever we want. We can be the hero of a book that doesn't exist. Hero? No. Kelsey had spilled too much blood to be called a hero. Or just a really misunderstood guy. Teacher says I gotta use a round scissors in art. The imaginative adventures of Craig Williams and his friends Kelsey and JP secure their place in the number 9 spot. Craig of the Creek was a delightful appetizer of Cartoon Network's identity upon their transition into the 2020s. The beauty in its simplicity can neither be overstated nor discarded. I felt like a kid again when I watched this show back in April. Easy and faint praise to just hand out, but in a time where serialized narratives are massively in vogue, this is a rarity. Craig of the Creek's embodiment of childhood is magnified by the vivid lens through which it projects itself onto the viewer. The characters are actual children, not just because they're designed that way. 
They act, talk, and look at the world around them just as kids in real life do. That is, before smartphones, tablets, and freaking Fortnite took over their lives, Matt Burnett and Ben Levin have interpreted the concept of childhood almost perfectly by balancing its idealistic and realistic aspects into a cute and endearing package. I may not be following the show like I vowed I would, but I still wish it nothing but success. Do you know what makes a real hero? It's not the costumes, the gadgets, the cool powers. It's having your own movie. And that has always been my dream. Teen Titans Go. You are such a wild card. On your best day, you're an intriguing and ultimately harmless subject that can dish out a pretty decent joke every now and then. On your worst, you give a shite like the return of Slade. And then there's this. Color me impressed. For the record, no, I am not one of the people who prayed for this movie to fail. I was all, okay, sure, whatever, fine by me. Then as the reviews rolled in saying that this movie's pretty good, my attitude changed to, when is this coming out again? And then I find out that my country wasn't getting it until September. Fricking Australia! When we finally got it, I was the only one in the cinema. It was a school day, okay? Why would it be full? But yeah, this movie was pretty good. I didn't laugh as much as other people did, but I still laughed nonetheless. And I accept that the comedy was well done. The comedic beats of the movie can be sometimes predictable and overplayed, especially in lieu of superhero movies before it that thrive on comedy, like the MCU and the Deadpool movies, but the jokes the movie goes for still hit their mark. And I say that they hit their mark because of the existence of those aforementioned movies. This is about as meta as you can get without going full on Deadpool or one other movie that I'll be talking about later. What also makes comedy successful, and people tend to forget this, is commitment. By that, I mean being able to take a joke, running with it, and using it to the fullest effect. If that can at least be achieved, it doesn't matter how predictable a joke is. And TTG to the movies runs with every single joke, and some fumbles aside, gets a lot of them right. Also, AHA's take on me and Stan Lee in one movie? Shut up and take my money! You did a good job there, TTG. Bet you never thought you'd hear me say that, did ya? Mirai. Mirai? It means future. This is your baby sister. And you have to protect her no matter what. Big brother. Stop putting cookies on my face! <gasps> have I ever told you that I'm something of an anime fan? If I haven't, now you know. This movie appeared in my things in animation to look forward to in 2018 list as an honorable mention. I didn't think it'd be this damn good though, and I'm proud to name the number 7 best of animation in 2018 to be Mamoru Hosoda's Mirai, or Mirai no Mirai, which means Mirai of the Future, or Future of the Future. A little redundant? Being the oldest among three children in my family, Mirai speaks to me. The movie was appropriately whimsical in its visual style, as befitting of the unrestrained imagination of a child like the protagonist Kun. Think of this as a better executed version of the boss baby, with more clear-cut defined intentions and… well, actually separating fantasy from reality. As trippy as this movie gets, I don't have to be on drugs to make heads or tails of it. More to the point, it doesn't hold back in showing the scares of having a brother or sister, nor does it hold back in showing its joys and wonders. Having a sibling is equally scary and exciting, an adventure in and of itself, not unlike what Kun and Mirai go through. And depicting sibling relationships as such, Mirai is a rousing accomplishment. Nobody's giving up around here, and don't you forget it, ever. You're Rex. You're king. You're duke. You're boss. I'm chief. We're a pack of scary, indestructible alpha dogs. <laughs> Stop motion animated movies are so uncommon nowadays, so thank God for Wes Anderson's I Love Dogs. Am I right? When you think stop motion, the first things that come to mind are the uncanniest examples that you can think of. Yes, this subset of the medium lends itself to the most bizarre imagery on the planet more than others, but it's sad to see it become stop motion's only purpose. Isle of Dogs is a step in the right direction in changing this attitude. 
pushing stop motion well past its limits and achieving some downright exemplary animation that this branch of the medium sorely needs. And correct me if I'm wrong, but this is so far the first stop motion animated work geared towards adults, if you don't count Robot Chicken. It may fall into the trap of adult equals comedy, but one, it's not bound to the genre, and two, its comedy is more nuanced than what you'd find in your run-of-the-mill adult animated show or film. The movie's storytelling is a more ambiguous area, being sound on a thematic and topical note, yet somewhat regressive in a cultural one. Had Japanese culture been portrayed more closely to what it actually is instead of through the lens of a tourist, and had the white savior issue not been present, this would have been closer to a perfect movie. But, you know, beggars can't be choosers. As it is now, Isle of Dogs is just a movie we need to validate the legitimacy of stop-motion animation and the rest of the medium. Cartoon Network did nothing worthwhile at all to celebrate its 25th anniversary back in 2017. Imagine my disappointment in that. Fast forward one year later and we get this thing of beauty, Crossover Nexus from OKKO OK Let's Be Heroes. This is the celebration that the channel should have thrown. It isn't just commemorating CN's legacy but also the legacy they inherited from Hanna-Barbera. As with similar milestone-based episodes, this one is exorbitant without sacrificing its overall quality. Ian Jones Cordy and his ragtag team have tossed in Cartoon Network faces and trademarks, well-known and obscure alike, in the ultimate show of respect and have bound them all into a simple and fun narrative. The best analogy I can make for this is an easter egg hunt. Except while kids and adults alike can join in, it's the adults, particularly the ones who grew up with the network, who get the most out of it. That's really all this episode needs, and it more than accomplishes its set goal. It's a trip down memory lane that takes into account the past and present and how they've paved the way for the future. Just picture what this could have been if it was 22 minutes long, with all the material that Ian left out of the final product. And there is a lot of it. Crossover Nexus is not only the tribute that people across the world have clamored for and needed, but it's one that Cartoon Network itself needs. This special lives and breathes its network, and it's perfect. Almost perfect. P.S. Ian, why didn't you make Gumball one of the central characters here? His show is a flagship of the network too, you know! There are thousands of girls working in offices just like me. There's no time to be tired, not when we're so short on staff! Front and center, Calendar! t t t But this girl has a secret up her sleeve. And a mic in her purse. Ah, San Rio, the Hello Kitty company. Nothing screams kawaii quite like they do. Makes sense. They practically pioneered the damn thing. And most other companies and properties that thrive on the kawaii brand of cute pretty much owe their existence to them. Speaking of screaming though, that brings me to Aggressive Retsuko, or its better known portmanteau, Agretsuko. One of the newer faces of Sanrio, this red panda in her mid-twenties is designed for the company's adult demographic. Her day-to-day -day struggles in life mirror those of most of said demographic and are satirized to an extent that they connect deeper with them. Retsuko's surge in popularity has translated into a plethora of merchandise and two separate anime series one on the Tokyo Broadcasting System, and one on Netflix. The Netflix series debuted in April 2018 to great and deserved fanfare. The characters are relatable, the social satire and commentary can't be any more relevant, and the quirky humor doesn't get lost in translation. Which is bonkers! And par for the course with most anime, the animation's remarkable too. 
Thanks to the increased standards in dubbing anime, the English dub is refreshingly well put together. Not a single line of dialogue is lost in translation, even those that just feel like they would be. And come on, who hasn't listened to even the smallest bit of metal music when they're pissed off? I do it. We all do. Agretzko is a welcome addition to the Sanrio family, and the Netflix anime series is a great gateway drug into the franchise. One of 2018's finest, I'm eagerly waiting for the second season. Don't let us down, Rare Cho. Rare... Co? Rare... Cho? Rare... Co? How do you pronounce that? Fourteen freaking years. It's about damn time. Words cannot adequately describe the ravenous clamoring for a second Incredibles movie, and the passage of time riddled with Brad Bird's cheeky allusions only whet the appetites of the masses further. Incredibles 2 mostly satiated that hunger. I said mostly because, sadly, some people just can't be content with what they're given. Seriously, all these guys crying, Wah, my feminism, zim, 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 need to shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Freudian slip. <clears throat> anyway, the film filled a quota of breathtaking visuals, high-octane action sequences, and age-inclusive writing that satisfies both old and young audiences without any mutual exclusivity. The advancements in technology have been a boon for the film, giving us lovingly rendered and meticulously detailed characters and articles, and beautiful animation all around. And the heightened standards in animation mean that the screenplay is more consciously put together, featuring dialogue, humor, and commentary that kids and adults alike can take something gratifying from. Now yes, I know that this is not a perfect movie, and as is part and parcel of anything that's accrued a mound of hype, the flaws of Incredibles 2 become more pronounced as the hype peters out. The plot is largely the same as the first Incredibles, the use of a twist villain is so damn tiring now that it's not funny anymore and bordering on farcical, and those bloody scenes inducing episodes are a pain in my freaking ass. But for what it's worth, this movie is still phenomenal. The aspects that it retained have been elevated to a higher degree and lent a stronger thematic resonance in an even more fun thrill ride. And for building upon the base set by the first film, Incredibles 2 is still firmly on an equal playing field as the first film. Definitely an awesome movie that I and many others had a blast with. P.S. Square, please make The Incredibles one of your DLCs for Kingdom Hearts 3. Please! There's mystery everywhere you look. Come on, Twig. Let's get my sketchbook. Done. Time to go. If you were to ask me what's an animated work in 2018 that touches on the finest human sensibilities, my answer would be the Netflix original series, Hilda. An adaptation of the eponymous acclaimed graphic novels by Luke Pearson, the series has hit every ball thrown at it out of the park. A captivating series that does so much right and so little, if any, wrong. In this era of animation, serialized storytelling is highly on vogue. With shows like Star vs. the Forces of Evil and Steven Universe ruling the roost today, Hilda's odds are not in its favor. Thankfully, it's successfully proven that it can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the competition. Due in no small part to its lush and lively animation, its balanced color scheme, a smoothly progressing and quirky narrative, and a strong ensemble of characters. Also, Luke Pearson himself is involved with the show, serving as one of its executive producers. That'll ensure consistent quality. Among Hilda's merits, its most defining one is by far its characters. Every one of them, well written, with distinct strengths and weaknesses, at least one of which a viewer can connect with, creating effortless chemistry with each other, and developing at a masterful pace throughout a story that's also developed at the same natural pace without compromise. The titular character herself is a breath of fresh air. I can't remember the last cartoon child protagonist with the amount of agency 
jealousy that Hilda has. It must have been the Pines twins from Gravity Falls, which is hilarious because comparisons have been made between Hilda and Dipper and Mabel. That aside though, I adore Hilda the character. Her adventurousness, her enthusiasm, her awkwardness, her hesitance that slowly but surely gives way for her compassion to shine through, her stubbornness and resilience. I love this character. Do not take this out of context. Move aside, Gumball and Steven. Hilda should be the blueprint for child characters from this point forward. Any aspiring cartoonist or raconteur who want to have children in their stories, especially as central characters, you can learn a thing or two from this girl. All in all, I am head over heels for Netflix's Hilda. As with aggressive Retsuko, I excitedly await the second season. 2020 cannot come any faster. 2020? I'll be 28 years old by then. Son of a bitch I feel old. <laughs>
On a personal note, these design choices hark back to fond memories of Marvel vs. Capcom 3, which also had a similar comic book-esque artistic approach and employed most of the same techniques. It's nice to see these mediums affectionately acknowledge each other and their contributions to the creative arts. The characters and narrative of Into the Spider-Verse are another big talking point. Miles Morales is a welcome addition to the Spider family, his personality endearing and resonant and his struggle enticing. This is ultimately Miles' adventure, a coming-of-age tale where Miles blossoms into both a superhero worthy of carrying the Spider-Man mantle, or the Spider-Mantle, <laughs> Oh come on, at least give me a rim shot. Thank you. And a young man with a whole world waiting for him. The other spider people were great too, that's for certain. Peter B, Noir Spider-Man, Spider-Ham, SPDR, commandeered by the best character in the film, Penny freaking Parker, who I swear I did not know was 13, get off my back damn you! <clears throat> Sorry. Continuing with its comic book inspirations, Into the Spider-Verse also has many meta moments that serve as its narrative and tone. It knows that you know the basics of Spider-Man by now. It doesn't just move past stating the already established, but takes a few jabs at them too. This meta-awareness composes a chunk of the film's writing, humor, and sincerity. Speaking of meta, I fought hard not to cry when I saw Stan Lee on screen. He and Steve Ditko have got to be smiling down from heaven at this jewel of a film. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse is a masterpiece in every sense. A beautifully woven work that respects the character and the artistry that goes into comic books, animation, and film. Not one aspect of it is compromised to favor another. Everything is treated with due diligence. Thus, everything about it shines. One of the best incarnations of the web slinger in any media, and the definitive best of animation in 2018, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse is amazing. And that's gonna be it for the top 10 best of animation in 2018. I'd call it a worthwhile conclusion to a mediocre year, wouldn't you? With 2019 still in its infancy, there's no telling what's in store for animation in the days to come. So far though, it's looking to be a bright future for the medium. And with one more year to go in this decade, the anticipation and excitement are sure to be all the more palpable. I for one am optimistic moving forward. Thanks to the standards set throughout the course of this decade, I can rest easy knowing that animation will only continue to grow. It's gonna be interesting. That much I'll say. So how about you guys? What animated shows and films from last year were your favorite? And what are you looking forward to the most this year? Tell me all about it in the comments. And if you haven't yet, hammer those like and subscribe buttons and check me out on social media. Thanks for watching, guys. Until the next video, I'm the one and only C.R. Martin, and I'll see you later. Ciao for now. You've opened up my eyes,